Good morning. Uh, today is September the 4th, 2006. We are at the cottage in Long Lake, Wisconsin. We're here this morning to do an oral history of Gordon Toffness and his service during World War II, his life and his service in World War II. Gene Toffness, his wife, is also here with him this morning. And we're going to get some information from Gene, too. But uh, primarily here to talk about uh, Gordon's service and his experiences during World War II. Uh, can you go ahead and introduce us to yourself, please, Gordon? I'm Gordon Toffness. I was born January 13th, 1920. I'm from a family of 11 children, seven girls and eight boys. I have number eight. Okay, and uh, you grew up in Shell Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, what was your, what was your life like uh, growing up in Shell Lake in the Shell Lake area? Very good. I graduated from high school from the Shell Lake High School um, in May of 1939. I was born and raised on a dairy farm, and I stayed home and helped my dad for one year before I went to chiropractic college in St. Louis, Missouri. And you were you were 21 when you went into chiropractic college, is that right, Gordon, or 20? Yes. And at that time... Well, I was 20. You were 20 when you entered chiropractic college? Yes. And that was right about the time that the service had restarted the draft? They had had the draft for several years, but you had to sign up for it when you became 21. So I got signed up January 13th, 1940, 41, 1941. Okay, so you were in chiropractic college, but you knew that at some point there was a good chance that you would be drafted into yes. the service? And when you were drafted into the service then, where, where was your first, uh, where was your boot camp at? First one in the service in St. Louis, Missouri at I'm trying to think of the name of the barracks but anyhow that's where we were drafted and we were there for about uh, well from November 17th until we left for to Camp Barkley, Texas by train and arriving in Camp Barkley Texas on Sunday morning, December 7th, when we heard about Pearl Harbor. So you arrived at, at camp uh, on Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, what, was the, what was the feeling like at the camp uh, when you woke up on Sunday morning and heard the news that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? We were shocked that this could happen to us. Our barracks sergeant said, fellows, he said, eight weeks from now, we're on our way overseas. And we were, but he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, what about uh, a little bit... Okay, when you, so when... What was your boot camp like or your training camp like... Uh, Basic drill, drill camp? Oh yes, basic drill camp. 20 mile hikes, full field pack, and many of them. Overnight bivouacs in pup tents, and everything that went with it. And did you feel prepared to, to go off to fight after boot camp, or? Well, we were not issued rifles. Never had any training in that. So, uh, just a matter of getting physically, getting fit. physically fit in during boot camp. Yeah. And what was you were in the medical corps, yes. in the army branch of the medical corps. Right. And do you remember the branch number? When we arrived in India, we ended up with the in the 81st General Hospital in Karachi, India. Before that time, we went to Fort Story. After we finished our basic, went to Fort Story, Virginia, for a couple of weeks, and then down to to. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and we were boarded ship the SS Brazil, 
the Brazil was a freighter passenger. It went from New York to South America. It hauled freight and 300 passengers. There were 5,500 of us on board ship. 5,500 on your ship, and you were shipping to India, is that right? Right. And you had a very difficult... Uh, yeah, we had 62 days on board ship. 62 days to go from Charlotte, North Carolina to... Yeah. Uh, what what city did you go to in India? Karachi. 62 days from North Carolina to Karachi, India. On the way, we stopped. We went down to San, Bo San Juan, Puerto Rico, and we are in the harbor there two nights. Then we pulled out of there and joined a convoy that went to across the Atlantic to the Freetown, Africa. I've never seen the ocean so smooth. Not a ripple for 12 days. And we got to Freetown, Africa, and that was a huge harbor, and there was hundreds of ships. And of course, on, on, out in the ocean, we had saltwater showers. But there in the harbor, you had no showers. We laid there for one week. We were issued one quart of water a day. No showers. No showers and one quart of water a day. And you had there was a lot of sickness on the on the oh, okay. the trip over from North Carolina to Tremendous India. Tremendous amount. Before we got on ship, we were all given cholera shots. And 95% of the men ended up with yellow jaundice. And they were sick. And we buried one, we had one soldier that died on the way to India, and we buried him at sea. Some of them were sick, and they never even left the ship. They were shipped back to the United States. And when you, uh, so you arrived in Karachi, India, then after your 62-day trip across the Atlantic, um, what, what was your first impressions of arriving at Karachi and at the hospital? Uh, well, uh, we arrived there. We were the first Americans in there. And uh, that evening we had the English soldiers picked us up in trucks. And we had their first meal with them. And we were talking to them and they were talking about India. And they said, they, they, they said after you've been here as long as we, which is 10 years, you will never want to go back to the United States. We laughed. We said, huh, we're not staying 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so their, their impressions of Karachi were favorable then? Yes. But it was interesting when we got on, on the trucks to go out to our base hospital, which was in the Sin Desert about 20 miles out of Karachi. We saw written on the wall there, welcome Americans. British quit India. Of course, they'd been there for years and years. So they wanted their independence from Britain, but right. they were still welcome. Yeah. Welcoming the Americans. Yeah. Do you want to tell about the black soldiers? The oh war? yes. On board ship, we had 500 Negro soldiers in the army, and they were put two decks below the waterline. They were arrived, allowed to come up on the deck one hour in the morning and one hour in the afternoon to get air, sunshine. And I thought it was a crime that here they were in the American Army and treated the way they were. They were soldiers the same as you were, but That's not right. not treated Wore the, the same, same, uh, uh, uniform. same uniform. And they, when they got to Karachi, they ended up as dock workers on loading ships. And the uh, so the the hospital in Karachi was it? Were there casualties in the the hospital in Karachi? What was uh, what was the hospital atmosphere like? Uh, they were uh, they were casualties there uh, that were brought in by train or shipped in by, or flown in from other parts. We were in the CBI theater, which is China, Burma, India theater of war. And that was the one, one of the first big hospitals there. 
or 400 of us GIs, and I forget, we had American nurses there. And I was there for, I was, uh, before I shipped out to Ramgar, India, I was working in the dental department. One of my jobs there, there was no electricity that, that would work on our American currents. Okay. So in the dental department, my they had a had a uh, thing I had to pedal for the dentist to use the drill. <laughs> and if you got slow, why then the drill went. <laughs> <laughs> so different times. And then then on top of that, I had to. <laughs> mix up amalgam filling for fillings, which had mercury in it. And to finish it, I had to put them on a hand and roll it so they got it nice and smooth and everything. Just imagine the mercury that went into my body. And then an order came through, or not an order, that I heard about it, for 40 men to go to India-Burma border, and I volunteered. So I got out of that dental department. <laughs> what were you doing in Burma then? I was in x-ray work. I, I had the x-ray department. We had one old English x-ray machine. Took good x-rays. But it had the glass tube and the white lead protection. And if I stood too close to it, into the tube, any closer to 12 inches, it would arc to my shoulder. <laughs> and uh, I didn't do that very often. <laughs> that will keep you on your toes. <laughs> American general came in one day for a chest x-ray. He looked at it and said, will that give me a shock? I said, yes, sir, if you get too close, I'll knock you on your butt. Well, why don't you get good equipment? I said, in the warehouse up here are seven American x-ray machines in boxes. Two days before I got shipped out there, an order came back down to Go up and pick out anything I wanted. <laughs> I let the other fellows do that. <laughs> but uh, excellent. Um, so after, did you go from Burma then to a, another assignment? What year was that that you were in in Burma then, uh, Gordon? I was there. Uh, let's see, forty-two. I got up there probably about uh, on India Burma border about June or July, and I was there until the following July. Then I was lucky enough they had orders for 40 men to go back to the states to form a new general hospital, and I was lucky to be chosen for that. Because the original fellows I went over, they were in India until World War II India ended. Okay, so you you left uh, Burma then in 1942 and came back to and, the United States in 43. In 43. Yeah. Right in the I heart got, of the I war got, then. Uh, back to the states here about in August. Got leave to go up the army. I went up home. And I was then ordered to Camp Grant, Illinois, which is just out of Rockford, Illinois. And my folks said, well, the Andersons live there. They're originally from Shell Lake. Okay, so you had friends of your family in that area then where you yeah, were in Rockford, reassigned. Illinois. So I went to see the Andersons and Jean was there. And so I stayed. <laughs> and that's where you met your wife, <laughs> yes. Jean? Okay, and that was still during during yeah. wartime, though. Oh yeah, that was in September of '43, and the next April 29th we were married. So met in September and married in April. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I think this would be a good time. The middle of June, I left for Europe. So you were you were let's see you were home from April until September and married Jean, and then left for Europe in June of 40, 44. 44. 
And uh, where were you I was stationed, stationed in England, out of Burford, England, which was about 100 miles north of London. And I was an x-ray worker there. And the war ended in Europe. And we closed down our hospital with orders to go home for a leave and then to leave for the South Pacific. In fact, when the war, when we dropped a bomb in Japan in August, Gene and I and our son Jim were here at the cottage at Long Lake. So you, you had orders to go to the South Pacific arena prior to the atomic bomb being yes, dropped. Right. And that was canceled then after the atomic bomb was yes. dropped and the war ended? All right. Because I had accumulated so many points being overseas to India and then to Europe that the war ended. And then on September 30th, I was discharged from the Army. September 30th of 1945? Yes. Okay. Um, and let's go back. I want to go back a little bit and talk about some of the experiences that you had with the uh, different people, the native people that you met in India and in Burma and in England. Can you share a story maybe from each uh, one of those? When you first landed in Karachi, can you... Um, first of all, I think you re remember te you telling me that the people in Karachi and India were very... Very uh, accommodating, very nice. Very nice, very nice, yes. How about the nurses? Oh, well, that that was up in in uh, Ramgar, up at the Indian Burma border. We had 40 Burmese nurses. And Oh, I can't think of the name of the medical doctor. He was a missionary in Burma for years, and he had trained these girls to be nurses. And in fact, they did minor surgery, too. And they were little girls. Oh, probably four foot eight. But boy, they were, they were strong and agile and did a wonderful job. They had a lot of medical training for that time? Yes, yes, they did. And how about then when you, you moved on to, uh, to Burma, how about the, what were the people like in, in Burma? Do you have well, any experiences? We were on the India-Burma border. So, but we had in the hospital, this was a base for Chinese training center. We had 40,000 Chinese soldiers on the base. And they were brought over from China they, some of them had been in the service for many years, but they never had any training. When they got over there, they were flown over by over the hump by our American planes. And they had these padded uniforms on that were filthy and whatnot. We had a small river going through the camp. So told them to undress on one side, gave them a bar of GI soap and a brush. Get out in the river, clean up. When you get clean, you go to the other side. If they weren't clean, we sent them back in the river. <laughs> and they got on the other side, and we issued them American uniforms. And they thought they were in heaven. It, and did you say that those were Chinese soldiers, Gordon? Yeah, Chinese. Uh, the United States was at war with China at that time. Yes, yeah, Japan was. Or Japan. Japan, yeah. Japan, yes. Yeah. They had invaded China and also Burma. So, uh, so the United States was an ally with China at that right, time. Right. Right. And it wasn't until after the war then that uh, that uh, Mao Zedong came into power. Right. Right. Okay. All right. And how about uh, some of the um, the people that you met in England? What was your service like there? Or do you have an interesting story of the people from England or the hospital in England? We had a, a big general hospital there, a thousand beds. We were right next to a big air air for, uh, field that the bombers took off and landed there when they went bombing in Europe. 
And uh, the day of the invasion into uh, Holland, Denmark, from that airport, the huge planes had towed behind them three uh, motorless craft that there were about 18 GIs in each one, fully full packed. And they towed them across the channel and they got over to wherever they were going to land and they cut loose and they come gliding in. They're, they're gliders. Paratroopers. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't uh, jump out of those planes. The whole glider came in and they landed. Of course, a lot of them were injured in landing. But three days later, we got into our hospital. They threw the flu GIs right from the battlefield back to our hospital. One day, we had 300 casualties come in in two hours. And in three hours, we had them all cleaned up, in bed, fed. They were pretty happy. And your hospital was large enough to be able to handle 300 casual casualties at a time? You oh, were yes, overwhelmed we were. by that? Yes. When you get 300 casualties and in two hours you have them all settled down, you're, you, you, you have quite a few people. Yeah, you were on top of, uh, yeah. top of it then. All right. And was, that, was there a particular battle that those casualties came in from that you remember? It had to be in Holland or Denmark in that area. Okay. And was that, did you see that uh, more than one time where you were hit with heavy casualties? Was that common that a lot of casualties would come into your hospital or was it more of a rare? Uh, uh, for that many, that was a rare thing. But otherwise we'd get casualties that were flowing in. You were, so you were seeing war casualties oh, yes. every, every oh, day? Every day, yeah, yeah. I always remember one GI, you were a private, and he would have been in France, and he got hit in the abdomen with an 88 shell. And he lost all of the intestines except for 18 inches from the stomach to the rectum. So he was fed intravenously. But every, every morning, our commander got a telephone call from General So-and-so in France. And how was my friend Private So-and-so? Well, I can tell you one thing. That private was flown by states real fast. <laughs> because our commanding officer didn't want to be responsible for his health. Okay. Often or often. So he had special care. Oh, yes. How about, was, I know you were doing, but was there for you, Gordon, that you did when the duty experience in your course? When I was. Well, when we were karate there, two, three miles and a couple, but, uh, just on the base. And we up there, we'd been there, got a leak, and we used river, but there, Hindu really. So we were called out, and they would, heat would carry a bathtub, and that's it. But it was getting away during uh, 10, 12 months. We what, um, about some of the people that you, someone that you met in this maintain relationship, with, or that had a strong input, or some, uh, remember, that you kept in contact with the war? Oh, well, one of the, uh, was a, Jim Bottom, he was a car drafted this day, he ended up in India, and he went in China. And see him until after the war, back to college of Carpenter. And uh, then there was a yet from Denmark. He was the best man for Gina at her wedding. And, uh, oh. How about a particular um, with impression on someone that was in charge of your unit that you remember, in uh, charge of hospital or in charge of troops? Yeah, we were in we were in the Sin Desert out there, that big hospital four thirty got off to give us a order drill. It was still dark. And this on for three months and our unit we had two mess sergeants, old army mess sergeants. They said, You really don't do this, do you? So there one morning outside of the general's office. So we asked what was going on, we told what this man was doing. That cap disappeared. We knew one in his place. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't have to get up. I had never. <laughs> like that, you thought I had a rock. 
So uh, now we're doing a job and all these extra things. I'm trying to. What about General? India? Generals? Oh, General Well was in charge of our base up at Rambar, India. Walked into the office one day and asked for a telephone. He was just had a leather jacket on. He got on the phone and he rattled off Chinese, just, oh. And he hung up the phone and got to the door and this and said, you probably don't know who I am. No. General Still, of course, everybody jumped up. They said, he said, Sell. I'll remember this in this camp. He said, we don't waste any saluting, sirs. We got a job to do, do the job, fun. And he said, if you want to talk to me, come talk to me. You don't have to have a appointment, just talk to me. So the respect is all. Oh, uh, right. That's right. Yeah. How about um, as the as the years passed, uh, do you remember, um, were you lonesome for home during the holidays? Or did you keep in, were you, did you write, I don't suppose that you had a telephone to call home. Did you write letters uh, back letters. and forth letters, to the yeah. United States? Yeah. And you kept in contact with your family that way? Yep. How about uh, what, what were some of the, what was it like in the service or thing? Um, did you did you celebrate those holidays at, at all? You're just uh, business as usual. Uh, there was some celebrations, nothing like we were home, <laughs> you know that. Uh, uh, and some of those were just like order a day. There was a dying day, ladies. And yes, uh, of course, in England. And uh, when war ended on, in Europe, that Sunday we sang in the big cathedral place for not take nine him, and that was. In wrong 1909, because that was signal for if Germans invaded England, all the church bells in the country would ring. So they were ringing right at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. And when the you were already back in the states then when the is that or when Europe ended, were you still? Yes. So what what were your impressions then um, in 45 when the when the war ended in Europe? What was uh, can you describe the atmosphere and what was going on at the time? <laughs> Very. People were celebrating, yeah, kind of coming out of their shell after five yeah, years, years of I, war. I was in, I think it was Burford, that day, and the English had come up and shake hands and just with joy that those ended. And how about the, the uh, troops that you were with? What was their uh, uh, happy that, what, do you remember anything, troops, the day the war ended in England? Like you say, just happy. And waiting for the day for us to ship home. And then you were waiting to ship back home. Yeah. All right. And then uh, when the war in England ended, you did come back home. You were still in the service. And expecting to go to the Pacific Theater, but your uh, the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima then mm -hmm. before you had to go to the Pacific Theater. Um, can you talk about what the... Uh, atmosphere was like in in the United States then at the time that the atom bomb was dropped and the war ended in the Pacific. Well, that day, Gene and I were sitting here at the cottage on Long Lake, and that was a happy, happy day. So we were not in any town or anything, but I'm sure there was big celebrations. And you pretty much knew that you would not have to go on and, and serve in the Pacific Theater at that time. I hoped. You hoped you wouldn't have to go go back, because you had uh, one. Jim was born at that time, or Jim was on the yeah. way. Jim was what, four months, five months old when I met him the first mm -hmm. time. Five months old when you met your son. Yeah. Yeah. Must have been quite a quite a happy day. That's right. All right, and then after the war ended, um, you were in the the medical corps during the war, and and you're a doctor of practice. Did your uh, did your service in the military, do you feel that helped uh, with your medical field? It must have, uh, the experiences that you had must have given you a yes, lot of... Yes, a lot of it's in the action. Because India Burma border, there were a time where you didn't have an extra officer with a medical doctor that I've never actually in my life. Will you help the films? Of course, I, uh, sometimes I'd get in and have to take x-ray, and I'd write up a web reading on it, set it with a patient or whoever had to go, and uh, so they knew that I could read the x-ray. So you were reading x-rays for some of the doctors yeah, then? Yeah, yeah. And then I would take dictations from the medical doctors. I did that in 
India, in Burma, and England. So I sat with and he watched film and writing down his dictation, his report. So I got a lot of x-rays, which really helped me in my life. Okay. And from the, I'm going to ask some questions about after the war then, Gordon, but anything, um, any stories or any anything else you want to contribute from the, from the active war um, times? Well, I think of before we shipped over to India, they told us wear our woolen uniforms, which we had to use in February, because you'll be on ship all days. We crossed the equator twice in woolen u uniforms. <laughs> And four or five of one day, I don't know how we got there, but we got in, we were, we had barracks bags, we had A and B. A we kept with us, and B went in to hold the ship. And in that, B, B was our summer uniforms. Four or five of us got down in the hold of the ship, I don't know how, but we did. Here's 5,500 barracks bags piled on top of one another. I stepped down on, and here was mine. Serial number, 3718281, something in white, with my name on it. So I <laughs> opened it up and took out the uniforms and got out of the hold of the ship because the next day some fellows got down there and they got caught. They were put in jail. <laughs> <laughs> For getting their summer uniforms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but on board ship going over, we had bad food. I think everybody had dysentery. I one day got to where the kitchen was. It was ground beef, hamburger, green mold on it. So that's why everyone on the ship was there. I'm sure. I'm sure of that. Yeah. And if you had to, the only way you could get into temporary hospital there, you had to have a temperature of 104. <laughs> Before that, they didn't have room. There are so many sick people. We had a, there was a swimming pool on the board this SS Brazil, but they put a cover over the top, steep steps going down into it, and around the edge and all the way around, they put toilet, toilet bowls. So they used the swimming pool as a latrine then right. because everyone was sick. And they were close enough, the bowls were close enough because I remember one day when I had a dysentery and it was vomiting, I could sit on the stool and I could vomit into the next one. So a and, lot of sickness on the oh, way over to India on the amount. ship. All right, um, any other stories from the active wartime that you want to share, Gordon? Otherwise we well, can I talk think about... Well, I think we should bring in... Gene here, so that tell about how we met. Yeah, I would like to hear that part of it too, because Gordon was actually in the service at the time that he met his wife, Jean. So, um, let's uh, let, let's get some history from Jean as well. Can you just introduce yourself, then, Jean? Please. I'm uh, Jean Toffness. I was Jean Anderson. And like Gordy said, he came back from India and was stationed at Camp Grand outside of Rockford, Illinois, where we lived. And like he said, our mothers knew each other and from, Shell, from Shell Lake. And uh, so he looked us up and even became active in our church. He was in the choir. My sister and I were singing in the church church choir, and he joined that, and uh, on his days off, he would uh, come in, of course, and we dated. We'd go to movies. Once in a while, we would go to an armory and dance, and uh, otherwise, he just kind of hung around. <laughs> and I think it was in September, uh, yeah, September that you came, and the following April, 
29th, we were married. And in June, he was sent to, uh, uh, to England. And uh, I was a teacher in Rockford. And after he left, I just stayed on with my parents. I was still living with them in Rockford. And uh, so I lived with my parents until he came back. And in the meantime, I had our first son, Jim. I was pregnant when he left uh, for England. And uh, so my folks just took care of us, going through childbirth with me and everything. And sometimes we say now, oh, we wonder, did we thank them? For all that they did yeah. while you were for all they did getting for started? Mm-hmm. Um, how about, uh, can you talk about some of your feelings? You must have had pretty strong feelings then when you were uh, married in April and Gordon went back to England in uh, June, did you say? Mm -hmm. What? Uh, that's only um, three months that you had uh, married right. together before he had to leave back for the service. Mm -hmm. What were your feelings when he went to England then? Oh, that was uh, that was a hard one. Uh, you know, it was a, at that time, we didn't know what was coming up, what was going to happen to him, and what future we could look forward to. Uh, it was a hard time, and we corresponded, of course, by letter, and uh, yeah, it was a hard time. But we should tell about after we got out of service and uh, he went back to college. He was back there in, what, a month? No, four days. Four. <laughs> after he got out of service, he was back in St. Louis at the Logan College of Chiropractic. And he'll tell you about the GI Bill that was really a godsend to a lot of GIs after being in service. Okay. Um, so a after service, then you um, came back and picked up Gene, obviously, and then you moved back to St. Louis right. to re-enroll at Logan College. Is that right, right Gordon? That's correct. That was in that was about the fourth of October, nineteen forty-five. Right. Okay. And uh, before we got down there, why my sister and brother-in-law, Doctor Van and Vivian Fanander. There was a little trailer park on the campus, and there was a trailer there for sale. So they bought it for us. It was small. It was six feet wide and 12 feet long. <laughs> and Van had built a little crib in the corner. For we had Jim. an ice box. There was a, had an ice box, and when we opened up the bed, you couldn't get out or you couldn't get in because it, the door was that covered half the door. But uh, we lived there. We survived. And uh, but it was just great to get get back to college. Just great. And the GI Bill enabled you to do that. That's right. It took care of tuition, books, any equipment that I needed. And it also gave us $200 a month for living expense. And that's what we survived on. So you had living expense money while you were in college? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember what, um, what your tuition was at Logan College of Chiropractic in, at, at that, that time? time? Yes. For four years, it was $1,350 tuition. So your whole your four years of chiropractic school, the tuition bill was thirteen hundred and fifty dollars at that time. When I started, well, when I got back, tuition went, had gone up and up and up, but and still climbing today. Do you know what it is today? Yes, it is five thousand. It was five thousand dollars year a year ago for every semester. Semester. Ten semester, that's fifty thousand. It's more than that today. Okay, and you're still pretty active with Logan uh, Chiropractic College. 
Yes, yes. I uh, I was on the alumni board for a short while, and then I was elected to the board of trustees, which I served for the college for 12 years as president. And of course, I go back every summer. I also still lecture to students all there all, all the time, and uh, so I stay active with it. And um, so you graduated from Logan College then about three or four years after the war ended, is that right? No, I, uh, I graduated uh, in uh, August the 1st of 1947. We go year-round down there. You don't have a summer vacation. Okay. And uh, so uh, we came back to Cumberland, and I joined my brother, Dr. Ian Toughness, in his office. Then in '49 we built the clinic. So you you went into practice immediately. Then after graduating, right. your brother had already had a practice oh, yes. established. He'd been there for uh, 17 years. And you joined him in business then in in 1949 in yes. Cumberland. 47. 47. 47. Yeah. And you built your clinic in 1949. 49. And your clinic is still there and operating today? Yes, and my youngest son, Dr. Tom, owns the clinic today. So. Excellent. So that is uh, from 47 to 2006 is... Uh, I still work part-time. 59 years. Yeah. yeah, this is my 59th year. I only work Monday morning and Thursday mornings now. Still seeing... In the summertime. In the summertime when I'm old. Summertime Otherwise, we're in, we're in Florida six months out of the year. Excellent. <clears throat> um, any other stories from the, the GI um, bill then? Or that, you know, your trailer park uh, experience after the war? Well, the GI bill was just a wonderful thing. It helped thousands and thousands of GIs. And uh, I understand that they're reinstating that today. So, for some of our veterans. Yeah, I think the GI Bill is still active, yeah. yep. Um, how about, um, were you in any of the um, the war service organizations like uh, the American Legion? I've been a member of the American Legion for 60 years. And um, how about uh, any, um, did you attend any of the uh, World War II reunion? No, so we never had any from our units. So, uh, often one wish we could have be interested in see who's still there. But there are not many of us left anymore. I just happen to be 86 years old now, but so uh, our numbers of the GIs of World War II are disappearing fast. I would like to go back to you a little bit. On the ship we went to India, the SS Brazil. No, I'll just go, we'll forget about that one. When I left India from Bombay, we got on the S, the, uh, oh my goodness. A ship, anyhow, that carried 12,000 GIs. But there were just 300 of us on coming back to the States. So we had lots of room. And I remember in the area where we were, we had four bunks high. And we put our barracks bag on the lower one. We folded up to the second seat. And then we slept on the third one and we folded up to the top one. So we had lots of space coming back on that ship. And when I left for Europe, out of Boston, here was the same ship I came back from India, and they gave us a number and a compartment, and I ended up one bunk from the one I came back from India, <laughs> out of 12,000 possibilities. <laughs> I kind of felt like a home. <laughs> Knew that spot. Yeah.
<clears throat> that was the SS West Point. All right, um, Gene, do, do you have anything else to add from um, the that you know era that you want to remember um, from? Oh, yes. Uh, as I said, I was a teacher. And in Illinois, you had to quit teaching when you got married. Why? I don't know. It was ridiculous. And it was true in Wisconsin, too, because Gordy has sisters who were teachers, and they, too, had to quit teaching when they got married. Like the Dark Ages. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't make sense. All right. Well, um, I really appreciate you uh, talking to us today. And um, I appreciate everything that your generation went through. I think it's one of the most uh, interesting generations. And uh, the rest of us in the country owe you a, a debt of gratitude for your service. Uh, what you built in the United States and your uh, service during wartime. So I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you took the time to talk with us today, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you.